Hi, I'm Nick Gillespie for Reason TV. Today we're talking to Jeffrey Myron, author of the forthcoming book, Libertarianism from A to Z. Jeff, you teach at Harvard. Uh, you're an economist. You've written a book. What prompted the, uh, the, the volume? Uh, I taught a course about six, seven years ago when I first moved to Harvard titled The Libertarian Perspective on Economic and Social Policy. I came for a visit. I said, what should I teach? They said, whatever you want. Just teach your stuff. And I thought, oh, wow. I wonder what my stuff is. And I sat down and started thinking about my views on policy very broadly. Um, I thought a lot about drug policy before that, but then I started just going systematically through everything, and I taught that to the students. They seemed to like it, and so I had these lecture notes, and I thought, oh, lecture notes are sort of halfway to a book. You have been <laughs> teaching college uh, for how many years now? About 25 years. Yeah. Do, uh, do you, is there any sense, we often hear that libertarianism is the next it philosophy for generation X, Y, Z, ABC, whatever. Do you have a sense that students, are they more or less libertarian than they were 25 years ago? My guess is they're a little bit more libertarian. You definitely do not get the feeling of the strong social conservatism amongst very many of the students. Mm -hmm. um, but overall, I don't think it's a radical change. Overall, they seem to roughly reflect the politics of their parents. So there's some, some conservatives, there's some Republicans, there's some Democrats, and there are a few libertarians. Um, maybe a little bit more tolerant on the social stuff than I think was true when I went to college. Do you find, are they more skeptical of government power and of corporate power than they used to be, or really no, noise around I, zero? I think it's noise around yeah. zero. I mean, I don't see any obvious change in the overall attitude. Let's uh, talk about uh, libertarianism from A to Z. And in your first uh, entry is in A is abortion. Mm -hmm. What is, how do, you, how do you deal with abortion in the book? So the position I outline there is that it's a relatively subtle, hard issue. It's not one where I think libertarians or anyone should take an extremely strong position at either extreme. Okay, if you think that a fetus becomes a person, then at some point, sort of laws against murder must kick in. Nobody thinks that there should be abortion for five-year-old kids. Okay, but very but few as a people, parent, let's say we, you know, we <laughs> might rethink that. We don't want to take a hard light against that. <laughs> obviously, yeah. parents rethink that once in a yeah. while. You know, obviously, at the other extreme, not very many people think that a two-week-old fetus is equivalent to a human life. Mm -hmm. So rather than sort of arguing about where life begins or ends, I think we should need to think about, well, the policy. What would happen if we had a policy of banning abortion? And one thing that would happen is some people would still get abortions, so that's sort of awkward. It breeds disrespect for the law, rewards people who are willing to break the law relative to people who don't. Um, and so to me, the natural thing is to define legal abortion somewhere in between, and even better to leave defining legal abortion to low levels of government, to states rather than to the federal government. Why because is that better? It's better in my view because there will be variety. There will maybe be a few states that absolutely ban it, but I don't think very many. There will be a lot of states where it's more or less identical to current policy, quite widely available legally. There will be a lot of states sort of in between or have some degree of regulation. And I think that under that variety, most people, whatever their views, will not feel that the government has squashed their ideas, has squashed their position, has disrespected their strong feelings. Now, you, uh, in the book, it's, you, you talk about consequential libertarianism, or that's what you are. Define that a little bit and explain how that fits, because a lot of people would say, well, abortion is not something. It's, it's, uh, you know, it's an inalienable human right, or either to have one or to protect unborn children from them. So. How is a consequentialist libertarian perspective different than, say, a uh, rights-based libertarian perspective? So by consequential, I basically mean costs and benefits. I think that rather than saying there are certain rights, we say what will be the consequences of having this policy versus that policy. In the case of abortion, if we have a policy of banning it, we may reduce the number of abortions, but we won't stop it, and we'll have a lot of auxiliary consequences. We may have negative effects for some of the kids who are born who might have been terminated, for some of the families or other pre-existing kids in families where those uh, kids might have been born. And I think that when people really think about it, they don't really believe in these absolute rights. So take the right to be alive. Okay? Most people recognize that taking another human life is acceptable, not ideal, but acceptable right. in some circumstances, say, in self-defense. So people sort of implicitly use this balancing of costs and benefits, and I think that's what it makes sense to do broadly, and that's where I come out 
on abortion? Uh, the final entry is uh, for Z is zoos. <laughs> what, a, what about zoos? What's the well, liberta consequentialist libertarian take on zoos? The take on zoos is zoos are fine, but government support for zoos is doesn't have any very good, good justification. It means more taxes. It means that some government decides whether there should be a big zoo, a small zoo, whether there should be a zoo as opposed to an orchestra. And so government shouldn't be supporting arts and culture more generally. They should right. be letting individuals choose what books, what movies, what music, et cetera, they're interested. Yet the origin of zoos, or the kind of mo modern origin of zoos, really is a European 17th century, 16th century of royal leaders having expeditions come back with fancy animals. So the royal menagerie has always been a state institution. So what? let me ask you this, what's the chance of getting rid of zoos, of finally <laughs> saying to the Columbus Zoo, the San Diego Zoo, the National Zoo, you know, you're on your own? You know, that one I actually think we have a chance because states and cities are facing these huge budgetary pressures. It might not be so hard to convince yourself as a city council or whatever, gee, if we sell this zoo off to some private entrepreneur who will run it on a somewhat m more efficient basis, we'll get some money. The zoo will probably still be there. And so maybe that's the way to go. There, in fact, was an article in the paper the other day about selling off state liquor stores. Right. Now, of course, if the states had been running them in a profit-maximizing way, they wouldn't gain anything by selling them off. Mm -hmm. But states don't do things very well, so they probably will gain by selling them off. Let me uh, throw in one final entry that's also a difficult one, uh, one Civil Rights Act of 1964. Uh, what is, why is that in the book? I put that in the book because a lot of people, including some libertarians, think that the government should play some role in preventing discrimination or in punishing people who discriminate on the basis of race, sex, et cetera. And in particular, a lot of people would point to the Civil Rights Act uh, as having changed the situation for blacks relative to whites in the US quite dramatically. And I think that that's too strong, because I think that there were two things going on. One was that a number of federal actions prevented state governments from actively engaging in discriminatory mm -hmm. policies, okay, explicit Jim Crow laws. And that part, I think, actually makes total sense. It's mm -hmm. consistent with libertarianism. It's consistent with the Constitution. Many more other things that are done under the name of the Civil Rights Act, such as affirmative action imposed by government. And by affirmative action, you mean uh, quotas. Basically I mean, not, quotas. Not simply saying that uh, you know, we should make a, uh, an attempt to advertise jobs in among publications that underserved, uh, right. historically unrepresented minorities might be part of. Right. Affirmative action means yeah. a broad range of things. And some mm -hmm. seem sort of quite I innocuous right. and are probably not very costly. But affirmative action seems to evolve, if it's going to have teeth, into quotas. Mm -hmm. And I think those are sort of unfortunate for mm -hmm. a number of reasons, um, mainly because they lead to undervaluing of the accomplishments of minorities who would succeed mm -hmm. on their own. They lead to stereotypes that minorities can't succeed on them by themselves. Mm -hmm. And I think that's counterproductive for a longer term uh, move toward an egalitarian Does, society. You know, with the Civil Rights Act of 1964, which I guess is within libertarian circles is most controversial for really redefining a public space and a private space. Right. Um, is it, I mean, how do you do a cost-benefit analysis of saying, you know what, there's a real value to legally redefining a hotel or a movie theater or something as a public accommodation which cannot discriminate? Uh, because it would seem that that's actually a very, uh, you know, there's a lot of clear beneficial consequences to that. And well, what is exactly I, what gets lost there? And I, and I guess I that, don't you know. see huge beneficial consequences mm -hmm. because I think if private, if hotels, if restaurants, okay. et cetera, discriminated, uh, you know, even there were no law, they would lose business. They would be under commercial pressure, profit pressure to stop doing that, or other entrepreneurs would come in and serve mm -hmm. the groups that were not being served. So I don't think there's such a big benefit, mm -hmm. and I think there's a slippery slope. The mm -hmm. more we say government has the right to intervene for the, some public good, mm -hmm. the more we set the stage for government to define a whole huge range of things as being for the public good. Well, thank you very much. I hope the book does well, and I certainly hope the uh, philosophy does. Uh, for Reason TV, I'm Nick Gillespie, and we were talking with Jeff Myron, author of the forthcoming book, Libertarianism from A to Z.